We are recording. And Barb, you are good to go. Thank you. Um, so some of you, I see some familiar faces. Some of you may have heard me carry on about good bugs previously. So hopefully there'll be something new in this presentation for you. Oh boy, now it's not. Okay, <laughs> don't know why it didn't work the first time. Anyway, this is a quick overview of everything that we're going to cover in the five um, sessions. And predators, parasitoids, pollinators, and soil dwellers. Uh, and then the last presentation, the end of July, will be on applying some of this stuff to gardens specifically. Okay, so the kinds of beneficial arthropods, and we'll talk about arthropod characteristics in a minute, but insects, of course, are the most common animals on earth. Uh, and some of these are not insects. And so I thought I would cover them briefly as well. Notice the color coding. If it has a red asterisk, it's probably a predator. And that means that it is always beneficial in the garden because it's not going to harm any of your plants that you're keeping. Uh, the green ones are some of them. So insects are such a huge group. Some of them are obviously pests. Some are beneficials. Mites, likewise. There are some mites that we'll talk about today, which are not um, um, damaging to your gardens. And the blue asterisk is for to, to point out that almost anything can be a pest if there's enough of it. But on the whole, the ones that have the blue asterisks are beneficial. If you get an infestation, they might be doing some damage. And we'll talk more about that today and uh, also tomorrow, um, next week. OK, so uh, today we'll look at the characteristics, what makes something an arthropod, what are the different kinds of arthropods, and very briefly, we'll talk about metamorphosis or the life stages, because there are some cases where one life stage may be beneficial, but a different life stage may be anything but beneficial in your garden. But if it's not beneficial and it's an immature stage, if you like the adult stage, you have to deal with the immature ones. So um, please ask questions at the end. Hopefully there will be enough time. Okay, so characteristics of arthropods. A chitinous exoskeleton. You all know that insects have their skeleton, uh, arthropods in general, have their skeleton on the outside. And chitin is a chemical compound that has bonds similar to cellulose, which means that it's very resistant to being broken down. Now, in addition to the chitin, there are proteins and other things. But in the case of the crustaceans like this, I don't even know if that's a lobster or a crayfish, but they have particularly hard exoskeletons because in addition to the chitin, they also have calcium carbonate, which is similar to limestone. So they, they have much harder cuticles or exoskeletons than other kinds of arthropods do. Clearly from these pictures and from what you know, their appendages, mostly legs in many cases, are jointed. They have segmented bodies. If you look at a centipede, for example, uh, most of the segments are similar. But if you look at a spider or an insect, clearly there are three major body regions in insects, but each of those body regions during development is formed from a number of body segments. Metamorphosis, down here I've shown you a honeybee. Most people are familiar with metamorphosis in, in butterflies, where they go from the egg to the caterpillar, which is a kind of larva, to the pupa, which may be inside um, um, a cocoon called a chrysalis in butterflies, and then the adult stage with the wings. But not all insects have that kind of metamorphosis. And so the last slide in this presentation other than the references, um, will show some different kinds of metamorphosis. Now, ecdysis is a fancy term for molting. Um, if you're familiar with the term ecdysias, that means a stripper. 
So what insects are doing is they are stripping the old exoskeleton in order to grow. They don't grow at all after they are mature, which means that their wings are functional in most cases. Okay, what about classification of insects within the natural world? When I was a student, we only had kiss pretty coeds of 50 great schools, but more recently there have been uh, a cat, there's a category called domains that has been added. So there are only three domains. The eukarya are the organisms that have nuclei in their cells. And then there are two domains of prokaryotes, including bacteria and archaea, which are very similar to uh, bacteria. And here's something that some of you may say, oh, yeah, when I tell you. Animals include everything that aren't prokaryotes or protozoans or plants or fungi. So a lot of people, when they hear the term animal, they're thinking mammals, you know, warm-blooded, furry, nurse their young, et cetera. But all of these arthropods that we're going to be talking about, indeed, all vertebrates and invertebrates belong in this kingdom animalia because the other kingdoms contain other things. So then kingdoms are broken down into phyla and the arthropods are one phylum. Uh, phyla are broken down into classes, the biggest one of which is the insects. And then the class insecta has many orders in it. I'll, I'll show you a slide on some of those in a minute. For example, a hymenoptera, the membrane winged insects. Uh, orders have lots of families as a rule. The apidae is one. And you go down to the species level, which is the most specific kind of organism. And you, you dis determine or distinguish the species by using two names the genus and the species name. So with the honeybee, the example is Apis mellifera. Apis is the genus and mellifera is the species name. And there can be other uh, species within the genus that are different kinds of um, bees. Now the common name is what people normally use. Uh, so honeybee and entomologists are kind of particular about the way they write common names although they really don't like to deal with common names much at all. But to an entomologist, if the, word, the words are attached, that means it's not a true bee. So dragonflies are not flies, they're completely different. Horseflies are true flies. A little bit of entomological trivia for you. Okay, so here is a diagram of the arthropods, not looking at the other phyla within the animal kingdom. We're not gonna talk about trilobites because not only are they not around anymore, but when they were, they were marine. Uniramia just means that their appendages have only one branch as opposed to crustaceans where they all have two branches. We will talk about centipedes, We'll talk about millipedes, we'll talk about insects, and we'll talk about more different kinds of insects than are shown here. Now, chelicerata refers to the fact that instead of having chewing jaws, they have piercing chelicery. And the biggest uh, phylum, excuse me, the biggest class of chelicerates are the arachnids. And we're gonna talk quite a bit about spiders. Not only are they my favorite, uh, arthropods, but they are the biggest group of arachnids. We'll mention not ticks because they are never beneficial, but we will talk about some beneficial mites. And I'll mention that there is a scorpion in Virginia, if you didn't know that, and it is not um, very harmful to people. Horseshoe crabs, again, unless you're gardening on the beach, you're not going to have any of these in your garden, so we're not going to talk about them. Crustaceans, mostly aquatic. There are a few like coconut crabs that live on land. And then there are a few smaller crustaceans. You probably know what this is, right? It's a pill bug. And we're gonna talk about them because they will definitely be in your garden. Okay, so what about what's in Virginia? Um, Richard Hoffman was like Mr. Invertebrate Virginia. He passed away a few years ago, 
but he has written some publications that you may want to, to look at if you're really trying to find out about some of these groups. So he said that there were authoritatively recorded, that means in the scientific literature in proper format, 10,000 species of arthropods, but there might be two or three times that many, which have not yet been put into the literature. Unfortunately, I have some as well that I have not put, I have not published on. Um, he said between 18,000 to 20,000 native insect species. So this doesn't include any kinds of insects that are not native. Some of the cockroaches like the German cockroach, some of the bees like the honeybee are not native. Uh, and there are probably about 800 native spider species. Brown recluses are native, some of the other recluses aren't. Okay, so first of all, let's let's cover the crustaceans. We're not going to say a whole lot about them. Class Malacostraca includes all of the big crustaceans like crabs and lobsters and crayfish. Uh, but one order in that class are the isopods, meaning that all their legs are similar as opposed to amphipods that have different looking kinds of legs. And we're going to look only at the terrestrial ones because there are also aquatic isopods. So wood lice is kind of a general term, or it can be used only for the sow bug down here. And you may know the pill bug by their name roly-poly because they curl up into what is a very good ball and can actually roll around. Uh, they don't do that, but we can roll them around. But obviously this is a good form of protection. Uh, now they have seven pairs of legs, which is fewer than millipedes and centipedes. They have two pairs of antennae, they are a crustacean, but one pair is very small. I've never seen the second pair on either of these. They are the most abundant, therefore successful of the terrestrial crustaceans. Now, what do they eat? Normally decaying plant material. However, if you get an infestation and you don't have a lot of organic material in your soil, they may feed on seedlings, root, roots, root hairs, the lower leaves, anything touching the soil. So they are normally beneficial, but if you get an infestation, they might do enough damage to give you heartburn. Okay, myriapods means many feet. They have only one pair of antennae and they have elongated segmented bodies and they include centipedes and millipedes as well as a couple of groups that most people, if you're not an entomologist, are not familiar with. Now you're not gonna have house centipedes in your garden, uh, but you may find them in your sink because if they fall in, they can't get back out. Uh, just remember that uh, they are predators and therefore they're beneficial. I'm not recommending that you leave, let them run around in your house because they are large enough to scare people, but at any rate, they are not gonna harm your garden if one should happen to get out there, but I don't expect that would happen. So what about other kinds of centipedes? Centipedes are normally pretty flat in, in cross section, and they have one pair of legs per body segment. And that means they can move pretty fast. Their legs are pretty long for the size of their body. And they are predators. So that means they have to be able to move fast to catch prey. The only bad thing about these predators is that they do have these poison claws. Now they're really poison claws, not jaws, because they are through evolution modified from the first pair of legs. But you know, if you say a centipede bit me, nobody's going to argue with you. So uh, I wouldn't pick them up. They're beneficial because they eat anything smaller than them, basically, mostly insects, and that would be mostly pests. So beneficial unless you get bitten, uh, which hopefully you know better than to do. Millipedes uh, are round in cross section. They look very similar to centipedes, except if you see them moving, they move very slowly. They have so many legs and they're kind of like the cattle of the arthropod world. They just kind of wander around eating things. Notice here that it looks like they have two pairs of legs per segment. Again, during development, the segments fuse. So they really developmentally have only one pair per segment, but then the segments fuse. Um, so they move slow. The appendages are relatively short, 
for the body size, and that includes both the antennae and the legs. And they normally eat, again, dead organic material, but they can damage your seedlings if there are too many of them and they don't have enough to eat. Okay, here's something you might not be familiar with. And I put this picture in here. If you can see these little white things, that's the size compared to the hand of these garden centipedes. Now, garden centipedes are not really centipedes. As you can see, they look quite different. They don't have any eyes. Um, they are not venomous as are the gar uh, regular centipedes. And basically they are in the soil. You're not normally gonna see them on top of the soil. Again, they consume decaying matter, but if there's an infestation of them, uh, particularly in greenhouses, uh, you know, if you bring in some soil and the conditions are just perfect from them for them, uh, then they might cause some damage. But I, I've actually never seen one of these except in a soil sample. They're, they're kind of rare as a rule. And the, the parapods are again related to the centipedes and millipedes. They're one of the last described groups of arthropods. So we've known about them for maybe 100 years, 150 years. Again, they're very small. They eat all kinds of things in the soil, dead organic material, as well as living algae and fungi. Um, so I count them as beneficial soil recyclers and we can talk more about them when we talk about soil. Again, they may eat root hairs. They're so small, they can't really eat much else, but they're not usually abundant. I've never seen one of these alive. Okay, so arachnids, getting to my favorite group here. If you look at a scorpion, you see four pairs of walking legs or a spider or a tick. Two major body regions. Again, let's look at the spider. Cephalothorax, which means during development, the head and the thorax are combined into one tagma or body region. And then the abdomen, which is usually the biggest part of the spider. In pregnant female spiders, it's by far the largest part of the spider. Now in these, which remember there are chelicerates, the mouth parts are not jaws as they are in insects, they're chelicerae. So here's a chelicera. On most spiders, these aim downward. The end of the chelicera has the fang and then the venom glands are in the cephalothorax of the, of the spider. And no arachnids have antennae. So if it doesn't have an antenna, these are the palps on a tick. They're considered part of the mouth parts. They're sensory organs. Um, so they may look like antennae, but if it looks like this, looks like one body region, it's all fused, um, you know that is not an insect. Okay, so these guys have lots of different names and there are um, old wives tales, urban legends, whatever about them that I will address. You can call them phalangids, you can call them opilionids. Most people just call them daddy long legs. Harvestmen is another name for them. Notice that the uh, abdomen is broadly joined to the cephalothorax. So if you took the legs off, you wouldn't really tell it from a tick very easily. You can see segments in the abdomen. And that is one of the ways to tell them from spiders. The second pair of legs are the longest here and here, and they act as sensory structures. So they tap around using those um, to sense their environment. They're usually predators. Some species may eat more detritus and do less predation because it's a fairly large group. So diff different species are going to do different things. This one is eating what I think is a brown stink bug, which as you know, is an invasive, uh, non-native nasty pest. And that one may be eating the same thing. I'm sorry, I got two that were doing the same thing. Okay, my favorite group, the spiders. They all have venom glands except for one small family but not many are venomous to humans. Now, anytime I say this is not dangerous, I am, um, for, for people who do not have a bee sting allergy, 
because the venoms of different groups of arthropods are different, but venoms are like a cocktail of different toxins, allergens, enzymes, just a whole bunch of different things. So if you are allergic to bee stings, you should be careful about getting bitten or stung by anything, okay? But I don't know whether, I, I've never really talked to anybody. I should, Wendy Isles, I know, has a bee sting allergy, and I've never asked her if she reacts to the bites or stings of other things. Um, but anyhow, be careful if you do have a bee sting allergy. Now, as opposed to the daddy long legs, spiders have a constriction between the cephalothorax and the abdomen. It's hard to see on this pregnant female, but it's there, okay? So they're wasp-waisted, basically. They have spinnerets at the end of the abdomen. The silk is a liquid inside the spider, and it gets spun out, and as it meets the air, it turns into a solid substance, protein. Uh, it's hard to mimic it. People have been wanting to make flak jackets out of spider silk, because it is stronger than a steel wire of the same diameter, and of course, lightweight, but it's really hard to do unless you have spiders to spin it out. Uh, usually, spider eyes look like this. This is the basic model here where they have eight eyes in two rows. That Most of them have eight eyes, there are exceptions, but in some, there's a particular eye arrangement that helps you identify them. All spiders are predators. They do not carry disease. Most are not venomous to people. Um, although anything that breaks your skin, you might get a secondary bacterial infection. Anything. You know, you do it to yourself without an insect biting you or an arachnid biting you. So uh, I don't really worry too much about spider bites. Okay, so what is not a spider? People call these spider crickets. Entomologists call them cave crickets, camel crickets, because they have humped backs. Uh, and they do not attack. I, I once had a colleague at Hampton University who was sure that they were chasing her around her garage. But their escape mechanism is very nondescript. They, um, they'll just jump to get away. And so you may as well walk into them as they're jumping toward you. They just jump in any direction. Sea spiders look like spiders. They have the right number of legs, but the abdomen is very tiny and peg-like. And of course, they're marine. They live underwater. Spider mites are named because they spin these silk webs. There are other things that spin silk. You know caterpillars, some caterpillars do and some mites do. So they don't look like spiders, they look like mites, but they do spin silk. Okay, so here is an urban legend. Daddy long legs are highly venomous. Some people add on to it, but they can't break your skin. Well, they do have piercing chelicery. They don't usually bite people. You know, if, if a daddy long legs gets on you, it's gonna just run off. It's not going to bite you. Um, to complicate the matter, there is a spider which in addition being, to being called a cellar spider is also called a daddy long leg spider. And it's clear to see why. Its legs are among the most slender compared to its body size. They look a lot like daddy long legs legs. But remember the spider has the constriction, the daddy long legs doesn't. The daddy long legs has uh, segments in its abdomen and the spider, they're fused during development. These are the eggs by the way, of that female. Uh, and these are quite common in this area. The daddy long legs are actually more common in wooded areas than they would be in gardens, but that doesn't mean you won't see them in your garden. These, of course, you'll find in your basement or maybe your garage, not in your garden. Okay, so here is our venomous spider. The black widow, we actually have two species. I once went on a bio blitz where I found the northern and the southern black widow. So Latrodectus mactans is the southern one that people are probably most familiar with. This is a mactans where she has this beautiful red hourglass. Now, all of the black widows, and there are more than the two that we have, there are more out west, all of them have some kind of a red hourglass and just to be helpful, they hang upside down in their web. So you're looking down at 
the underneath side that has the red hourglass. And of course they are venomous. And if, if they're protecting an egg sac in their web and you get into the web, they will bite you. Uh, I will point out that less than 5% of people who get bitten by a black widow die. So they're not usually deadly. The sicker you are, you know, the more conditions that you have before you get bitten, the more serious the bite is going to be. Okay, but this is our indigenous um, venomous spider, the one to avoid, and they are very common. I have found them in depressions in the ground, uh, in um, greenhouses, all over the place, under my shrubs, in the uh, edging around my garden. I want to point out that there are other spiders in the same family. This one is not hanging in its web, but all of these tend to hang upside down that look like a black widow. But if it doesn't have that red hourglass underneath it, it is not a black widow. They're also very, very black. They look like black patent leather. And most of the steatodas are either brownish like this one or purplish. But I wouldn't go just by the color. I would you know, if it doesn't have the hourglass, it's not a black widow. Okay, so this is a much maligned spider. This is the native range of the brown recluse spider. And if you were to look at the whole family of, of recluse spiders, that it goes across the bottom tier of states. Here is the size. This is an adult male, so the females are going to be a little bit bigger, but it's still not going to be longer than the diameter of a quarter. Um, they're called violin spiders, easy to see here. And this marking is very distinct if you know what to look for. A lot of spiders have markings on the cephalothorax. None of them have one that looks like a violin except this guy. So it can be called a recluse spider, a violin spider. It's one of the few spiders that doesn't have eight eyes. If you don't want to get close enough to see how many eyes it has, I don't blame you, but chances are very good. You will never see one in your lifetime in this area. Now, uh, I was doing some research in northwestern Iowa, and uh, there was an article in the paper with a photograph. There are other recluse spiders, but we don't really know how venomous they are. Again, this one is actually less venomous than the black widow in terms of causing death, but it can cause some disfigurement. Um, there's, a, there's really a problem with people knowing what is a brown recluse bite versus the bite of something else. There's a guy named Rick Vetter who retired from one of the California, Southern California museums. And he's an expert on the brown recluse and recluse spiders in general. And I just remembered that I forgot to put his, uh, his name in the references. Uh, maybe I can remember to do that for next week for you. Now, this is a wolf spider again. Notice the um, four eyes here, two and then two kind of on the top. And the reason I'm showing you a wolf spider is as you'll see, just a second, um, people mistake them for brown recluse. So here's a wolf spider. A lot of wolf spiders have markings here. Doesn't look like a violin, right? This is a grass spider. Again, markings do not look like a violin. And grass spiders and the whole family Agilinidae are easy to identify by having long spinnerets. Remember the spinning organs. And here's a good picture of that cellar spider showing you just how long the legs are on that. And of course, um, they hang in webs. If you see a brown recluse, it's probably not in a web. And these guys, these guys don't make webs at all. These guys make a funnel web, particularly abundant in the fall, in the grass, or in the forests. OK, the scorpions. We do have one in far southwestern Virginia. So you're not going to find any of these in your garden. If, unless you move to Lee County. They're called Southern Devils, I think is the most common, common name. Also the Southern Unstriped Scorpion to distinguish it from the striped scorpion. Here's its scientific name. Again, not dangerous to humans in the sense that its venom will not kill you, will probably not make you very sick. That doesn't mean that you're not going to get a big bump or feel a little sick or something. An inch and a half long, nocturnal predators hide during the day. Now, 
you may or may not be aware of pseudoscorpions. These are really cute little guys. If you just look at a picture of them, they look pretty ferocious. They're called pseudo or false scorpions because they don't have a sting. They do, however, have the pinchers like the plain old real scorpion. That's called chelate to entomologists. You'll find them under bark and stones, but you'll find them in leaf litter and moss, so you may find some of them in your yard or garden. And again, they're predators. Most arachnids in general are predators, so that therefore they're beneficial. This guy is so small, he's not going to eat very much, but he's not harmful. And last but certainly not least, the insects. And you probably know they have six walking legs, head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The legs and wings are attached to the thorax. The antennae are on the head, as well as the mouth parts. They have one pair of antennae, you can see here. One pair of compound eyes, that's the big faceted eyes. They also have three simple eyes or ocelli in the forehead area. Most but not all adult insects have two pairs of wings. There's one entire order called Diptera, meaning two wings. Those are the flies. They only have two wings, not two pairs. And insects are the only invertebrate that flies, which is one of the reasons that I chose to study spiders for my PhD, because they couldn't get away from me as easily. Okay, so some of the characteristics that are used to tell what kind of insect it is uh, whether or not it has the kind of metamorphosis I already mentioned, and we'll come back to that. Whether it has four wings, two wings, or no wings, there are a few, like silverfish. Uh, it tells you which order of insects. And then if you look at the veins, these are veins. Interestingly, veins in insect wings do not carry blood. The blood or hemolymph in insects actually runs along the veins, not inside of them. The veins in the wings are kind of like bones in a bird wing. They're for structural support. What kind of mouth parts? Here are some examples. You know that butterflies suck nectar, beetles can chew, bugs can pierce and suck, as can mosquitoes. And then bees are interesting in having both chewing mandibles that they can use to eat pollen, as well as a tongue that they can use to lap nectar. If you look at the antennae on this beetle, they might look like something you've never seen before. And I just didn't have enough room on this slide to show different kinds of antennae. And I wanted to be sure that I left plenty of time for questions. So um, I tried to cut this down from a 75 minute presentation that I'd given before. And there are different kinds of legs. Cockroaches, as you know, run very fast. Mole crickets dig tunnels. Uh, grasshoppers jump, so they have specialized legs for doing all of that. Now, there are about 30 different orders of insects, depending on the taxonomist or systematist. Uh, it can go all the way from 26 to 32, I think. So I don't like to memorize numbers, but there are lots of different kinds of insects. These are the orders that have the most species in them. Everybody agrees that beetles are the most abundant insects, therefore the most abundant animals on Earth. Uh, Coleoptera, notice this P-T-E-R-A means wing. So most of the order names have that in them. And the coleo refers to a sheath. If I go back for a minute, let's see if this works. So in beetles, the first pair of wings is just held out. They don't flap to fly. And the second pair of wings unfolds from under them in order to fly. So the first, the first pair of wings are a sheath or a cover for the other wings. Moths and butterflies, lepido, lepidoptera means scale wing, diptera, two wings, bees, wasps, and ants, hymenoptera, membranous wings. Um, now, I'll talk about that in a minute. Crickets, grasshoppers, et cetera, katydids, orthoptera means straight wing. Okay, so the ones in red, at least some of them are beneficial. The ones in green, none of them are beneficial in your garden, although you may like to look at them like I do. Now, the blue asterisks means there's been a change in taxonomy. I prefer the old way, so that's what I'm giving you. 
Um, these two groups used to be separate orders. So Hemiptera, the true bugs, and incidentally, that answers the question, so what is a bug anyway? Uh, one order of insects is the true bugs. You can call anything a bug, but it, an entomologist would disagree. Uh, homoptera means the wings are similar. Hemipterans have a peculiar kind of wing where part of it is, is kind of leathery, like a the front wing of a grasshopper, and part of it is kind of membranous, like the wing of a wasp. Homopteras, on the other hand, the wings look the same throughout. Uh, so homopterans are still homopterans, but whether you call true bugs hemipterans or heteropterans depends upon what you call the whole order. So some people call the order that contains all of these heteroptera and, and then the suborders as I've given you, and some people call the whole order hemiptera and call these the heteroptera. If that isn't confusing enough, just call these true bugs, and then you can call these by their common names, or you can call them homoptera and say they include a lot of different things, white flies and some other things. Uh, throughout all of these presentations, I'm, I'm giving you either the most abundant um, the most local or something. I'm not giving you everything. So if you have questions that go beyond what I've, I'm giving, please feel free to ask questions at the end. Okay, so again, these used to just be called primitive insects. Now they're frequently called um, hexapods, meaning six legs. Well, the true insects have six legs too. But these, if you call them, uh, regardless of what you call the whole, whole order, insecta or hexa, hexapoda, um, these guys are usually put at the order level. And again, these are soil dwelling, litter dwelling. They're normally beneficial, okay? They don't have compound eyes. You don't see any big compound eyes on any of them. They never have wings at any stage of development. You don't see their mouth parts because they're in a pouch in their head. Uh, I have read both that this family in the dipleurans are more predaceous than this family and that some species of both are predaceous. But at any rate, then uh, some of them in these groups are detritivores, meaning eating, decaying, or dead organic matter. Um, I don't really believe that any of these can cause any damage. These are extremely abundant in soil. You may also see them on the surface of uh, standing water. They're called water fleas in some cases, but of course there are other things called water fleas as well. And there are some that are called snow fleas. Then in the middle of winter, if there's any snow, uh, you can see them hopping around on the snow. Even though they're called fleas, they do not bite. Okay, these guys eat, again, dead organic material, fungi, algae. Uh, this one is my favorite. For some reason, it reminds me of the Energizer Bunny. So there are different families that look differently. Um, but at any rate, there are beneficials in soil and leaf litter, and they will be abundant in your garden if you have organic material there. If you have a real, really dead soil, you might not have as much of them. Okay, oh, I'm doing so good. I'm actually going too fast, so I can, I can go through the references with you. Um, so metamorphosis technically means a change in shape. However, there are some even true insects, not just the guys that we just looked at, that don't change much. All they do is grow and mature sexually. And so this is sometimes called a-metamorphosis, meaning without metamorphosis. And silverfish and jumping bristle tails are uh, a good example of that. And of course, you may have silverfish in your house. And unless you have an infestation in some of your books where they might be eating the, the glue that holds the book binding together, they're not going to be a problem. Um, a, a second kind of, met, well, a kind of real metamorphosis is called gradual. And in gradual metamorphosis, like this, they start out looking like they're going to look as an adult, except they have no genitalia, so they're sexually immature, 
and the wings are just little wing buds. It only shows in this one. The other ones are too small. Their legs are in the way. If an insect's wings extend beyond the abdomen, you know it's an adult, you know it's not going to get any bigger. However, there are many insects where the wings are do not extend to the end of the abdomen, particularly in, even in grasshoppers, some of the females, uh, the wings don't extend there. So uh, if they're functional, if you see it flying, it's definitely an adult and they don't molt and they don't grow unlike spiders, um, they don't molt and they don't grow once, once they reach sexual maturity. The, uh, my gallimorph spiders like the tarantulas can grow after they reach sexual maturity is my understanding. Okay, now some people will lump aquatic insects in and call it gradual metamorphosis and call the immature stages nymphs. I don't want to do that. So I'm a splitter in this taxonomy. Um, Incomplete metamorphosis means that you don't have a pupal stage, which some people call a resting stage, because they don't feed and they don't move around. So these guys don't have a stage like that. However, since they live underwater, they have to have gills because the respiratory system of a land arthropod doesn't work underwater. So in the case of dragonflies, they have a cloacal breathing chamber. They have internal gills. But in the case of mayflies and stoneflies and some other aquatic insects, they have uh, external gills. And so they, when they molt from the aquatic stage into the adult stage, they're really undergoing about as big a change as incomplete metamorphosis. But it's called incomplete because there's no pupil stage. And aptly enough, then the immatures, which are in the water, are called naiads. So complete metamorphosis is what I think most people think of when you hear the word metamorphosis. And the particular example that most people are familiar with is the moth or the butterfly. Where And notice that all of these guys have eggs. There are a few insects that can lay living young. Some of the flies, the eggs hatch in the body and they can larva posit. And uh, aphids can do that. You can have a young aphid just popping out of the mom rather than her laying eggs. Aphids can do amazing things. Um, so caterpillars will molt and grow as just like the nymphs of grasshoppers will do. And once they get to the last instar or stage, then they will pupate either underground. I think most beetles do pupate underground. And this beautiful Japanese beetle then is going to come out and eat your roses. So that is called complete metamorphosis. In the case, and I asterisk this to make sure that it's stuck in your mind, uh, in the case of order Lepidoptera, the moths and butterflies, all caterpillars eat plants. Okay, so you, you're not going to count them beneficial in your garden. Unless, of course, you really like watching moths and butterflies. The adult stages are also herbivores, but all they're doing is sucking nectar. And so they are not harmful in your garden. And um, one of the things that complete metamorphosis is all about is that the adult stages don't have to compete with the larval stages. So it, the butterflies are an extreme example of that where the food is completely different between the larva and the adult. Okay, so these are some references that I wanted to bring to your attention. Anything by Richard Hoffman is going to be about Virginia arthropods. He was a actually a millipede expert, but he studied all, I went in the field with him once and we collected spiders together. Uh, so he was like Mr. Arthropod for uh, Virginia. He used to uh, work at, I think, Virginia Tech. And Doug Tallamy, you, I know you've heard of him before. This is not his latest book. His latest book was on uh, oak trees and uh, oak trees host the highest number of uh, caterpillar species of any plant. Not only are they really big, but evidently they really like them. So anything by Doug Tallamy is a good thing to read. And then some other things. Uh, this particular book, I, I kind of stole her um, title. 
for this presentation. And there are, I have lots of others. So if you are interested in um, more references on arthropods, insects, spiders, particularly bees or spiders, just contact me. And the easiest um, email to remember is barbara.abraham at cnu.edu. My other email, I think, is the one that I have in the um, Better Impact or whatever that new site is called. But at any rate, feel free to email me if you want more references or if you have questions about any of these presentations. So that's it. I'm done. I made it in enough time for questions. Galen, are you here? Yes, I am. I was just seeing if there was anything in the chat, but I don't see anything. So um, if people would like to type in a question in the chat, or you can open up your microphone and ask Dr. Abraham um, your questions, please feel free. I see there's one in the chat. So if I open that, I'll see the question. Uh, yes, it's strange. I don't see anything in the chat, but yeah, go ahead. I see a one there, but when I tried to open it, nothing happened. Oh, wait, here it is. I think that's me. Oh, that was you. Okay. Yeah. So I didn't need to, but I have it open now. So if anybody has a question. I've talked your ear off for 45 minutes, so I figure that's long enough. The next presentation is actually probably hardly going to fit. I've been trying to cut it down for a couple of weeks now, and I haven't got it down to the size of this one. So I guess I know now how many um, how many slides I can talk about in 45 minutes, cutting it down from a 75 minute presentation. Okay, so hopefully everybody got something new out of this, even if you don't have any questions. And I guess I'll see everybody uh, hopefully next week for predators and parasitoids, at which time I will define parasitoid. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Abraham. Appreciate it. Yeah, so please join us next week. Um, you all enjoy the rest of your afternoon and take care and enjoy. Also enjoy your holiday weekend. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.